I'll just reiterate for uh, folks who weren't there in the morning. Um, and also somebody asked me to introduce myself again. Uh, my name is uh, Chiradeep Vital. I'm architect for CloudStack. And uh, Alex, can you reintroduce yourself? Alex Wong is the uh, uh, another architect in, in CloudStack. Uh, Alex and I have been working on the code since 2008. Uh, so uh, layer three cloud networking, um, as I said, you get your uh, VMs landing all over the all over the uh, subnets, not contiguous, and then you define uh, security group rules uh, to allow access between uh, VMs and from the internet. And the way it's it's enforced is that there's firewalls on each hypervisor, which lets you do that, and because uh, that level of control is not uh, possible in, in VMware. We don't support in VMware, but we do support it on KVM and, uh, and Zen Server. Uh, so those are the security groups there. And then uh, just a reiteration of how the IP addressing works here. What you get is um, in one pod, you get multiple uh, tenants landing in the same pod with, with the same range of IP addresses. And so with the firewall, we have to enforce the, uh, the security groups. Uh, one interesting thing we've done here for uh, Zen Server is that uh, to scale it, now if you, th if you think about having 5,000 VMs in a security group, and then you add one more, and then suddenly you have to allow 5001 IP addresses into the firewall. You program this firewall here saying that you know, let 5001 addresses, which cannot be summarized because they're all in different subnet. Uh, how do you do that? If you put in 5000 uh, IP tables rules, your latency is going to go into the toilet. Um, so we used uh, uh, a technology called IP sets to optimize that. And uh, that, that works fantastically well. Uh, but that's there only in, uh, in the Zen server. Uh, you need the cloud, cloud supplemental pack on Zen server to enable that. On KVM, if the code doesn't exist, mainly because none of the distributions that have KVM distribute IP set. Uh, so. Is that something easy to solve? We've got several distribution competitors here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. If that's solved, then yeah, we can put it in KVM as well. Well, uh, on this diagram, uh, should there be a virtual router between the pod uh, switch and uh, the guest VM? No, 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 there's no, uh, this is, uh, this is the L3 isolation mode, what Amazon kind of works with. Um, in this case, the uh, the load balancer is attached to the L3 core switch, and that can provide you load balance services. And typically, this is the one that provides you uh, a static NAT as well. So the virtual the virtual router is only used in advanced uh, advanced zone. Only in the advanced mode. Right. Okay. Um, to I'm going to show you the, uh, the virtual networking mode again, uh, which is the advanced zone. Um, so you have uh, two tenants here, the orange tenant and the, and the green tenant. We have started up uh, virtual routers for both tenants. And, um, and you can see that the tenants are aligned all over the cloud, but because they're interconnected with the same VLAN, they get to have the same uh, subnet IP addresses. Uh, so, and then because they're isolated by VLANs, they can even get the same uh, CIDR range and because they get their own virtual router giving them services. Um, so because we support multiple NICs and multiple networks per tenant, you can have some fairly interesting topologies. This is the standard out-of-the-box uh, network offering. 
So where the virtual router does everything for you, DHCP, DNS, VPN, load balancing. And then uh, what the cloud stack does is that it just has a pool of free VLANs. It picks a free VLAN for the tenant when the tenant creates the network and allocates that. And then if the network offering says, uh, I want a, a Juniper firewall and a NetScaler load balancer, um, that's possible too. Um, again, we pick a free VLAN and then we configure uh, VLANs on the SRX VLANs here, uh, assign public IPs to uh, the SRX and the load balancer, and off you go. And in this case, what the virtual router does is just provide DHCP and DNS. You could also have a uh, network with no services because some people want static IP addresses. And so there's no DHCP, nothing. All you get is a, a gateway service and then you're free to assign whatever IP address you want. Not particularly popular in the, in the public cloud because there's security concerns there, but uh, fairly popular in the enterprise. Um, in, in this topology, uh, we, we do support um, DHCP and DNS and user data, for example, with the virtual router. But when you deploy a VM, you ask for a specific IP address. And when the VM starts and sends out a DHCP request, uh, we match the request to the MAC address and then assign the particular IP to that VM. So you can get uh, a, a desired IP in your, in your subnet. Um, this is the, uh, the MPLS topology I was talking about. So you have your uh, service provider giving, it's like a service provider cloud. Um, he's bringing in the MPLS VLAN 100 from your data center or your uh, premises. And then uh, he's stretching that into your VLAN 100 here. And so these VMs appear to be local uh, to your premises. Um, Another topology possible, the administrator can create a shared VLAN and then allow different tenants to start up VMs on them. And that's, uh, that's also in a popular in the enterprise where you can say, well, this is where the web VMs are. And if you ever want to start a web VM, you got to start it on this, uh, this VLAN. And, and the different colors here are different tenants. Any questions so far? You could also do a, uh, a multi-tier network, the classic web, app, and DB. It's complicated. <laughs> so what you would do is, uh, you would get your web VMs to have uh, two NICs, one on the, uh, the, on, on, on the web uh, network, the app network, and then the database network. So the web VMs can talk to the uh, app VMs, and the app VMs can talk to the uh, DB VMs. And then the app VMs and the DB VMs can get out to the public internet uh, to get you know, patches or whatever they need to. Or you can even do like, how do you want to SSH into your app VM or into your DB VM? Um, go ahead. Okay, so that's very flexible, and I love this. Is that something that an administrator, uh, Cloud Stack administrator, has to set up all of these networks and tie them all together and assign them to an owner, uh, to a tenant? Or no. is that something that a tenant can have a pool of networks at their disposal and configure them as such? Yeah, the tenant can do it all by himself. Yeah. And if that's uh, SDNs instead of VLANs, that's all right? Not today. I don't, and I'm not sure that SDNs, uh, we haven't tested like multi NIC on SDN today, but yeah, but theoretically it's possible. So this is uh, with the advanced networking or basic network, advanced network? Okay. Uh, this is advanced networking. 
uh, basic zone it's kind of hard to do multi nic but in basic zone what you would do is you would create a web security group or app security group and a db security group and offer that way. but this is more a traditional enterprise style networking uh, security groups are still not you know enterprise enterprisey um and i i I mean, product manager keeps asking me for like when do we support site to site VPN or when do we do this or when do we do that and, and I like to call it yeah, you know bring your own service so what you can do is you can plug let's say you got a standard out of the box uh, networking with the virtual router what you can do is you can do create a shared VLAN let's say you wanted to give let's say you had a monitoring service which you wanted to offer as an additional uh, benefit to your uh, tenants so you start up a shared monitoring VLAN, and then whenever we, uh, a tenant creates a network, you create a specialized routing VM there, and then make sure that these VMs install static routes to go to the monitoring VLAN through this routing VM. So it's not highly automated, but it's doable, right? And then suddenly the monitoring service can access these VMs and then provide monitoring services. Also very popular in the enterprise. So same uh, same concept. Let's say you want to do site to site VPN. So I've seen people do like uh, start up a Viada VM here. They get access to a uh, shared public VLAN, and suddenly voila, their VMs have a site to site VPN to anywhere they want. But what happens is that the customer logs in to the Viada VM, configures a site to site VPN by hand or whatever automation tools he, he has. It's not through Cloud Stack, right? So this is possible today, and, I, and I've seen customers do this quite often. So this is the vision we're going through. Uh, I think, let me point out a couple of problems here. Um, this is uh, really awkward, because uh, if you wanted to say, well, you know, uh, you know, the web VM also wants to access, let's say, or if you log into the web VM, are you allowed to access the database VM? You know, how do you define those rules? Uh, that's that's quite hard to do here because we don't have control over the uh, the core switch that's doing all, which is interconnecting all these VLANs. So the vision is that we would have a uh, cloud stack virtual router. Getting all the, th the three VLANs, the web VLAN, the, uh, the uh, app VLAN, and the database VLAN. And then we would be able to specify ACLs between these networks. And then you could also specify firewall rules, ingress and egress. You could do uh, a site to site VPN using the virtual router back to your uh, premises using IPsec or SSL. Um, NAT port forwarding <laughs> as usual. And then define static routes. So let's say this this was the 172.16.0.0.16 slash 16. Then when this guy wants to connect back to the VPN, the virtual router needs to know that, you know, don't go to the internet for that address. You need to go on the VPN. And so we would define, allow you to configure static routes on the virtual router to be able to do that. And then you would, you'd probably want like a, a Netscale load balancer to do a heavy duty web um, load balancing. So then we would let you do uh, create a network offering which gives you load balancer on that VLAN as well. So very powerful. A lot of this is upcoming very shortly. Um, Comments. So, actually, I I have a question. Sure. And so, in, in this case, for the CS virtual router, or uh, if we have uh, if we have network elements that that can actually program the switch, uh, then you can actually just put just put the switch inside, right? Sure. Right. Yeah. 
for uh, SRX. SRX you could do that, yeah. Yeah, that's what that's why I put other <laughs> well what 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 is challenging is that if you're not a Juniper SRX admin or a Cisco admin, configuring a VPN or a, is just challenging, you know, programmatically or even understanding the, the tweaks you need to do. So well so the default for us is oh let's do it in the virtual router. Um, so then you could also define, let's say you had a monitoring service, and so you attach an additional monitoring VLAN into the virtual router, and then define route saying that who can access the monitoring VLAN. Hi, Charity. Yep. Richard here. Going back to the previous slide on the uh, MPLS. Sure. Um, a bit first of all, uh, a basic question in advanced zone. So all the traffics from the uh, guest VMs go through the virtual router? Not before... necessarily. If your service offering doesn't say that the virtual router is providing gateway service, then no. Oh, okay. So then well, my other question was uh, whether the uh, MPLS traffic, the, yes, the, the Ethernet frames, um, where the shim headers are added for to the uh, MPLS frames, are they being added uh, after the core switch or, or yeah, before yeah, the yeah. core switch? At this point, they just look like plain on VLAN 100 tag. Yeah. So it's just standard Ethernet frames. Right. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Um, so I talked about static routes. Uh, the vision is that you can even configure BGP so that you don't have to configure static routes and then it'll exchange routes with um, your VPN uh, gateway at the other end so that you automatically know where to route into the VPN. Uh, this is vision. Uh, some of it is coming, but not all of it is coming. And then uh, why not do it with the uh, overlay networks, right? Why use VLANs? Because then you're not limited by 4K VLANs in your data center. Um, so the exact same thing, don't use VLANs, but use overlay networks. Uh, in, in which case, the, uh, uh, the load balance will probably have to be a virtual appliance. And you could use something like uh, Netscale or SDX for that. Or even if I has uh, virtual appliances for that. Or you could stick with the virtual router. And then uh, you could also interoperate with uh, regular VLANs. So if your monitoring services is on regular VLANs, the virtual router can do SDN as well as VLANs. So a lot of this magic happens through uh, a concept called network offerings. And we've uh, talked about network offerings before. And so it's what the admin does is he gets a UI like this and says, well, what, what services are enabled and who's providing that service? So in this case, um, you can see that the virtual router is enabled and he's, when you press on the configure, you can configure, well, what services is this uh, network, uh, is the virtual router offering? And then when you actually create the network, you choose a virtual network offering uh, to create the network. And you can also upgrade between network offerings. And when you install CloudStack, there's like three or four default network offerings installed already by default. And that's, uh, that uses the virtual router. Why is that blank? Oh, there. So uh, reiterating the offerings, Compute offerings, disk offerings, network offerings. Um, I've talked about storage tags and not sure if I talked about host tags, but you, you can actually define network tags as well to define uh, which physical network the virtual network is configured on. Um, Does anybody have any questions so far? 
on the disk one, you have two tags for storage. I can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, the sharp eyes. Excuse um, me. Excuse me. Sure. Uh, when we use uh, redundant virtual routers, yeah. uh, are there are multiple no northbound internet side IP addresses, or uh, is it is it uh, aggregated into the virtual IP address? Um, I think what happens with uh, redundant virtual router is that on the on the guest side, they get different IP addresses, uh, and they just it does a takeover of the IP address when the failover happens. Mm -hmm. I can understand that the guest guest network side. Right. I can understand. However, how about the internet side? The internet side. Public network. The I think the uh, the public interface is shut down mm -hmm. until the takeover happens. When the takeover happens, then the in interface is enabled. And then the IP addresses are configured. Uh, okay, so bo both sides use both sides use the the same IP. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, both sides use VRF. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So one floating IP between two routers. Exactly. Yeah. One owns it or the other. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um. I think you went through the code for some of the network service providers, but let me just iterate. A network service provider is a uh, hardware or virtual appliance that makes a network service possible. Um, example is a net scaler for load balancing, um, SRX for uh, firewall, and then you can have multiple instances of the same provider in the network. You can have like multiple net scalers, multiple SRXs, and you can have one provider provide multiple services. So you can have the NetScaler do static NAT as well as load balancing for you. Or you can have the SRX do uh, source NAT and firewall and VPN for you. And uh, these are the supported uh, providers today. And we're looking for the community to add more and more uh, providers. Uh, this is just the uh, admin UI and how to add an additional network offering. You can say that you can specify the uh, services offered by that provider. Oh, in, in, oh sorry, so the services offered by that network offering. And uh, nice matrix for you to show what's supported on what. Um, if you wanted. Uh, Load balancing, uh, FI, big IP, Netscaler, or the virtual router would support that. Um, if you wanted user data, only the virtual router would support that. So, uh, we, th these slides will be put up, and you can you can look it up. Um, blah blah blah. Let's see here. So there's a dedicated set of uh, APIs to uh, create and destroy a network. So to your question before, can a tenant create the networks? Yeah, absolutely, you can create a network. You just specify which network offering it it needs to be. Uh, you can delete the network. Uh, when you restart a network, it restarts all the devices if it's allowed, and then uh, reapplies the configuration. So if you feel that your Juniper SRX has, doesn't have the right configuration, it's just not doing the right thing. You could go and the admin could, you know, call the admin and say, "Can you please restart the network for me?" He would do that, and CloudStack would reapply all the configurations. There's an update network API. It lets you update the network offering. So what you would do is uh, shut down on the VMs and say, "I don't want the virtual router anymore," and then you would transfer the public IP from the virtual router to the SRX because that's the which are, that's the service offering you're, up, you're upgrading to. Um, 
this is how you would do shared guest networks. Uh, you can specify whether it's shared by a project, an account, or a domain. Uh, you, you can restart or clean up the network through the UI. And then what it would do is uh, reapply all the public IPs and, and rules for you. Uh, and then deleting a the network, if, if you have no VMs running on it, it'll uh, you can delete it. And also one feature that uh, CloudStack has is that if you're created the network and then run some VMs on it, and then you stop using or you destroy all your VMs, and then you haven't used it for days. You have a garbage collector that comes in and says, "Ah, oh, you know, this VLAN can be used by somebody else." Um, so your 4K VLANs uh, is, you know, not a hard limit after you create 4K networks. So uh, I was going to go through an example of uh, what a new service would look like, a new network element. So today in our uh, in, in CloudStack, we don't let you configure DNS externally. And I, somebody asked me the other day, well, can I configure my CMDB to you know, update my external DNS server? Um, so I was just thinking, like, how would we do this? You'd go in and define a new uh, interface uh, DNS service, subclass from uh, network element, and then make sure your your DNS element implements um, the the API, which would be like uh, um, the the APIs which uh, Alex showed you earlier, like prepare. So the VM is starting. The network manager gets a prepare call um, that gets sent to the network element, gets intercepted by your DNS element. He says, I, I know what to do here, calls the uh, a DNS manager. The DNS manager says, uh, OK, I need to talk to my uh, DNS service resource. He sends a JSON command, uh, add DNS record. And then this guy knows the API um, to talk to the, um, the, the DNS record, or the DNS server of, of uh, the master DNS server. And that queuing happens through this uh, message bus, uh, which Alex talked about. Now that you have a, uh, your DNS device manager, you probably want to be able to add it into CloudStack using the admin API. So you would uh, make sure it implemented the pluggable service, and then provide the actual API commands which it implements to configure the DNS service. And so. These classes in blue would be your service bundle, which you could plug into CloudStack. Right? OK. And then uh, just as a note, your, your DNS device manager can write and read from MySQL, but your resource is not allowed to do that. Um, any questions on this? I know some of you guys are writing network elements. Is, is this the term network manager is a new term? I haven't seen that uh, before. Is this new term? Uh, network manager is part of the CloudStack kernel. It's, or, it's existing one. It's existing one, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, in the deploy VM sequence diagram, it, it was one of them, but I can't. But um, so a network, the network manager here uh, derives the process of setting up network, and is it, responsible for ta talking to the network guru to get to get network concrete network information, and then also informing all the network elements that participate in the network. So it drives that process. As I'm going to uh, 
describe what the virtual router. I think we we talked about what the system VM is earlier today, and virtual router is just one instance of the system VM. Um, it so it's it's the virtual router is heavily used. Uh, whether you're doing a shared network or a you know full featured uh, network with uh, with all the services, you know at least it provides DHCP and DNS to uh, in a in a lot of the service offerings in a lot of the network offerings. Um, and then the interesting part is that uh, you could have your uh, VMs, your VMs running on VMware and the virtual router on Zen server and then it would just work. Um, uh, typically the virtual router has three NICs. Each zero is uh, is connected to your guest network. It provides the DHCP user data, password change, and the gateway service. Each one is uh, is the link local or the control network, which uh, Alex was uh, describing earlier. Uh, on VMware, it uses IPs from the management network. On KVM and Zen server, it uses IPs from the uh, control plane control network. And each two is uh, on the public network, and it's assigned a public IP from uh, by CloudStack. And so, when you configure a firewall rule, we just may go in and configure IP tables to make sure that the traffic from each two to each zero uh, follows the rules that you configured in your firewall. Uh, likewise, when HA, if HA proxy is being used, HA proxy will um, start up an interface on the public IP. I okay. had a question. Sure. So this link local network, uh, it should be configured on the management network too, if uh, KVM is hosting the system VM. No, uh, this the link local is 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 kind of automatic. It's it's configured behind your back. You don't really tell CloudStack about it. It just and knows that it's KVM, so it better use a link local. What does it communicate on that? What kind of traffic is that? Um, sure. Uh, so link local is the 169.0 uh, class C address, which uh, which is non-routable. What happens is that on KVM we run a, a Java agent on the host on on the host, which communicates back with the management server. So let's say you had to configure a firewall rule inside the virtual router. So there would be a um, configure firewall JSON command sent down to the virtual to the host which is running the virtual router. The Java agent looks at that and says, oh, I need to SSH into the virtual router to configure this firewall rule. And it uses the link local IP of the, fire, of the virtual router to do that. And by default, you know, it's the virtual router is configured to block everything. It gives you a source net IP to get out of the internet. So uh, in the future, you said uh, VR ha will have uh, three NICs. Uh, what is current status? Only one NIC or what? No, no. no. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a... Uh, it does have three NICs. Has three NICs, sorry. Or oh, has. With okay. sharp eyes. What kind of uh, problems would you have if you if the system VM crashes? Uh, sorry, who was the question? Like if the system VM oh, crashes? Yeah. Um, so the system VM uh, is spawned of a, of a system, what is called a system offering. And the system offering includes HA features. So if we detect that the system VM has crashed, we will restart it. And then, because the system VMs are stateless, or their state can be recreated from the uh, database, uh, that doesn't lead to any long-standing harm. But if you're really concerned about availability of the virtual router, we could use the uh, the redundant virtual router feature, and then you could operate two of them uh, in in active standby. And it uses VRRP 
uh, virtual router redundancy protocol uh, between the two router VMs to ensure that at least one of them is up. Yeah, it, it, it kind of depends on which system VM. Um, some some of the system v, VM which we have, such as uh, secondary storage VM, which works on templates and and things like that. If it was in the data path and that VM is gone, so say for example, someone says, "Oh, I want to download the template uh, back into my uh, laptop," and and that download was happening, and or they were uploading a template into Cloud Stack, and that upload was happening. And the system VM dies because it's in the data path that uh, that transfer is terminated. Uh, um, but we do have code in in CloudStack. We have a manager that controls uh, and scales those VMs. So it will see that the VM is died. Died. It will it will uh, turn around and create a new one. And 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 then you can repeat the re repeat the uh, download process and, and things like that. But the end user would will have to be engaged in the download process. Uh, for virtual router, the re redundancy is done on the way that um, uh, Sharedeep has talked about. We, we have the RIPA um, uh, talking and to make sure that one router, another VM, can pick up this VM's traffic and you will have a temporary loss of uh, uh, network connectivity. Um, but you have to deploy that in that configuration. Uh. I think I discussed this not too long ago uh, about what's built into the uh, virtual router, and uh, that's it. I think I had. I have a possibly less technical question. I'm just sure. Curious. Why is the system VM a Debian-based template Dolphin master? Any particular reason? Um, so it used to be a Fedora VM. Uh, Fedora changes quite often, and then they don't. Uh, give you security patches after a certain date. <coughs> so that didn't work very well. So what was left was uh, CentOS or Debian or Ubuntu. Uh, uh, CentOS was still on 2.6.18, which meant a lot of advanced networking features you wanted wasn't there at that point in time. Um, and then Ubuntu was just felt too fast moving again at that point in time. Uh, Debian tends to be conservative about which uh, what software goes in and how well it's tested, but it could be anything. Um, I was going to discuss futures actually for a good couple of minutes. Um, sorry, I don't have any prepared material for that. Uh, but if you look at uh, the L2, um, I, I, saw, I showed you that we had hot plug not implemented yet. So that's something I would like to uh, put in. At L3, you know, IPv6 is definitely a must-have. I think a lot of customers are feeling the pain for uh, uh, running out of IPv4. Um, uh, on the VPN side, uh, you know, a lot of people, IPsec is uh, well supported by a lot of network vendors, but then uh, something like OpenVPN allows you to punch through firewalls much more easily. So having you know, like an SSL with OpenVPN built into the virtual router would be very nice. Um, uh, more support for SDN uh, in having multiple networks, uh, more scale, um, integrating with uh, physical devices and SDN. That would be something very interesting to do. Um, on the um, on the virtual router side itself, and I would love to see uh, support for other distributions, not just Debian. Uh, more work on solidifying, make sure the, the the security is solid on the virtual router. Um, as we move up the stack, um, at uh, for routing, you know, implementing uh, Quagga to do BGP or OSPF. To exchange routes with your VPN provider, and that's another thing I'm looking at. Um, on the layer seven side, uh, with HA proxy, it's a little hard to do uh, SSL, um, just because the the maintainer of HA proxy does not want to do SSL. Um, so maybe look at some other uh, product to do that, or do some kind of reverse proxy for that. Um, on the uh, 
today for a basic zone if you wanted load balancing and elastic ip you get net scaler and nothing else so support for f5 and also an out of the box support using the virtual router that's something i'm looking forward to on the um, uh, load balancing side again uh, ssl support uh, health checks is another uh, place we want to uh, get support in that in there for that um, I'm sure I'm missing a couple of other things um, and I think once we do SDNs you get to do a lot of interesting stuff like real you know trying to do routing without doing routing or doing ACL checks inside the uh, open v switch and so that's another thing I'm looking forward to doing